Hello and welcome to the, another episode of the Doster Geo and Phantom Podcast, this is the DTF Podcast. And it is Valentine's Day morning, 10.08 a.m. Uh, we didn't want to record yesterday because yesterday was, one, the day after the Super Bowl, and no one was talking about college basketball at all. And two, Mr. ESPN over here uh, had to fly back from Wichita to get back home. Uh, apparently, we got big time. Fanta, we were important for a while. Now T.O. is doing games on ESPN, not ESPN 2, big ESPN, and we just get pushed to the side. We get bumped to the side. We're just – we're not anymore, man. But, look, uh, as you make your rise to fame, Terrence, please just don't forget us a little bit. Hey, hey, here. Field of 68 <laughs> will always have top, top priority for me. I know. Well, yeah, you said Field of 68 till I die. It's literally our intro. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You guys always have top priority for me. No yeah. question about it. No yep. question about it. Fanta, I know you woke up juice because it's Valentine's Day today, man. What do you got in the works tonight? I have a lovely Italian dinner in the works, and I am making myself for my bride to be. We're gonna go with wonderful. <laughs> I, thought, I thought for a second you were just gonna say I'm making it for myself. I just <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I, but I, I'm making it myself in terms of uh, not often that I that I put the chef hat on, but we're gonna have some fresh pasta. We've got some really good meatballs, and it's going to be great salad, great garlic bread. I know Terrence wanted to turn the meatballs thing into some sort of a weird joke, but that's not going to go happen. At it. I was about to as well. Nothing better on Valentine's Day than Fanta's meatballs. No, nothing better on Valentine's Day than a little bit of fresh pasta from John Fanta. Well, that, let me tell you something. She's gonna find hey, out. Fanta, about does all she that like her night. pasta al dente? <laughs> that's exactly right. Abs- absolutely absolutely it's going to be a great valentine's night dinner i don't think it can be top because you two ha- are are choosing to just observe the holiday with flowers wait look i i told you this before we're going once to dinner get, once you get once you have kids like there is no holiday that has a greater difference pre-kid and post-kid than valentine's day <laughs> right am i wrong to you am i wrong no there's a lot of truth there it's not that you don't celebrate about you want to, mm-hmm. but my kids were off of school today. So like they, I wake up to a balloon in my face from a five-year-old. My son right. sleeps in till 10 and starts complaining. He's hungry right away. Just, not a whole lot of good, romantic. Good for him. Going on. Yeah. Not, not a whole lot of romantic going on up See, until tonight. So enjoy this Fanta. Enjoy it. I'm Alabama Valentine's day this year in terms of college basketball terminology, you are both Kentuckying and Carolining thinking, thinking that your reputation will be good enough for you to achieve success when really you're both fraudulent. No, Hey, I'm more, I'm more like Houston down here in Greenville. No, people don't really know what's happening on. Like I, I hold it down the entire year as opposed to having one big splash in the pan once per year. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. If, if we were going to make the argument, <laughs> Fanta is like North Carolina here, where he's just kind of like mediocre. He's just going through the motions. He's not really doing the job. Nobody really gets along. But then in crunch time, in March Madness, in the Final Four on Valentine's Day, that's the one time of the year that he actually shows up. So technically, you know, I'm out There's here a lot going on. There's a lot going on with that statement there, Doster. <laughs> You're heading straight to the bubble. <laughs> I mean, all right, listen. So you did mention Alabama, and I do think the the biggest takeaway we're we're gonna today's show was basically we're gonna go to conference by conference through the power conferences and talk about who we think is the biggest threat in March, not the best team. Who is the team that is best suited to make a run uh, in the NCAA tournament? But before we do that, um, it was a little bit of a momentous weekend in the fact that Alabama went into Auburn beat Auburn. They're the new number one team in the country because Purdue lost their second game in their last three uh, at Northwestern 64 to 58. Zach Eady had six turnovers. Looks like there might be a little bit of a playbook out on how to slow down the Boilermakers at this point. Uh, And meanwhile, on all of the metrics, Houston is now the far and away significant uh, favorite or best team on Ken Palm, on Torvik, and all those other different metrics. So, Fanta, I ask you this. Where do you stand? Do you, have you changed your mind on who the best team in the country is? Is it now clearly Alabama? Do you still think it's uh, Purdue when some teams just, you know, you get bit on the road when you're a Big Ten play? Is it Houston and we're just not talking about Houston? Where, where do you stand right now? Well, I think it's interesting with 
Houston that they're 23 and two and and we really have not spent a ton of time on them when you compare it to Alabama and Purdue and part of that is life in the American I mean the fact is Houston's playing in in a league that would be like eighth in the pecking order seventh or eighth somewhere in in that area um there's more juice in my opinion to the WCC just because you've got St. Mary's and and you've got Gonzaga there at the top and you've got a Loyola Marymount who's who's actually been able to beat those teams this year. We're not getting that in the American. The American is not a very good league. However, I I, I think we need to spend some time on Houston in a few moments, but guys, I'm going to spend time on Alabama right now. The fact of the matter is this in the SEC, 10 of their 12 wins have come by double digits. They have not started conference play at 12 and 0 since the 1955-56 season. And the job that Nate Oates has done in recruiting, in building out a roster, getting impact transfers, Mark Sears being one of them, the way that they defend and the tempo at which they play makes them not only the best team as we're talking on this fine Tuesday, but one of the very most entertaining teams in the sport. Mm -hmm. The way that they have dominated competition in a good league, a really good league, has been nothing short of exceptional. And it just goes back to what Brandon Miller has meant, but I also think the way that other players have gotten better as the year's gone on. Noah Clowney has steadily gotten better as the year has gone on. They've got guard depth. Charles Spediaco gets things done for them as well. They've got the complete package. And I know some people are worried about the fact that sometimes the tempo and the volume of three-point shooting could lead them to being susceptible to getting picked off or knocked off. But I would say that their style and their explosiveness, combined with the sheer individual talent of Miller and the Mm -hmm. coaching of Oates, actually makes them a safe bet. And it's seen in the results because they're not dominating the American. They're, they've been dominant in the Southeastern Conference. And in a year where there's a lot of teams that have a, a flaw here or a flaw there, and we say it's wide open, an SEC team being 22-3 and three on the season means for me that they're the best team in college basketball. Yeah, the, it's, the, the impressive thing, T.O., is that they defend without really turning the ball over, right? They're a top 10 defense, and they're not a team that that forces mm-hmm. turnovers on like 23, 24, 25% of their possessions. They're at 16%. They just kind of – they do what they do. They stay in their stance. They get out. They contest the three-point line. They run you off the three-point line. I think they are like top 30 or 40 or something like that in uh, percentage of three-point field goal attempts because they want to try to funnel you into Charles Bediaco. That's your guy. Mm-hmm. I know you like him. You hyped him up last night. Um, yeah. I do want to let me frame it to you like this, because I, I I do think that we are kind of overlooking Houston, but I feel like that's because everybody knows what Houston is every single year. Names change, players cycle through, but it's still the exact same team, the exact same program doing the exact same thing. It's got a little bit of Florida State to it back when Florida State was was really rolling. Does that make sense? Yeah. I disagree with that a little bit. I disagree with that a little bit, only because I think Jarris Walker is is just a, a talent that's head and shoulders above anything that they've had from a freshman perspective. Fair. I mean, he, he is I guess going my, to, my point was more like, pick. yeah, like he's he's clearly the best that they've had, but he kind of does the same job that all of the guys did before him, right? He He's just better at it. That's the impression. Like, it's pretty incredible he's 18 doing that. Most of the guys that Kelvin has are like 23, 24. Dude, he is put together. Yes. He is massive. No, Houston's really good. What – Samson gets those guys to do on a night-to-night basis. They just control their controllables better than anybody else in college basketball from a night-to-night they, basis. Are they the new Villanova in that you know what you're going to get from them, so you're not talking about them as much because mm-hmm. that not boring, but you're just you you've become so accustomed to talk about them winning that because there's no wave of change really, you're not going to you you see what I'm saying in that yeah. regard in that realm because for. For the last five, six years, we we just didn't focus a ton on Villanova because all they were doing was winning, and you knew what to expect from them. Houston feels like that. Like, for a program that went to the Final Four two years ago, went to the Elite Eight last year, I, like, 
are they the here's the thing they might not be the safest best to win it all to, to win it all but if you ask me terrence like who's the safest bet to make a regional final i, I would i'd say houston i would say they're the new gonzaga until next year when they're in the big 12 okay like because okay. compared to their league like Gonzaga doesn't have it this year, obviously, but compared to their league, like they are head and shoulders better better than everybody. Even a good Memphis team is going to make the tournament, or right on the bubble. Excuse me, field of, fielding of sixty eight. Uh, they should if, if Memphis doesn't make the tournament, like we got to have a conversation about Penny. Some to be said there. Some to be said there. Um, going back to Alabama, uh, you, you you reference their talent, and one of the one of the things when you have that much talent. Reminds me a little bit because we had Psycho T on last night on After Dark. It reminds me a little bit of that. Like when you have so much more talent than the other team, the best thing you can do is play more basketball. And the, the what I mean by that is play more possessions. So if if you're the better team, the more possessions you play, the better off you're probably going to be because then your talent's going to be superior than the other team's talent. It's like a team that runs the West Coast and, and wants to go as fast as possible. You want more possessions as opposed to playing somebody like an Iowa. You're trying to play at seven to ten, yep. right? Like it's it's one of, or, or excuse me, six to three, six, six to three. There was a couple of games they didn't even score a touchdown. But you get what I'm saying. Like more possessions is better, and that's harder to guard. So – I would argue. I would. It, what did you did you say? Like they're susceptible because of their style, or they're a safer bet because of their style. I, I'm saying, uh, actually, a little bit of both. I, I said mm. I think people believe that they're susceptible because of their style. I would. I think argue, it's the opposite. I would argue the opposite with this team, especially <clears throat> in a year like this one in college basketball in this <clears throat> season. They're, they're, the way that they play, you know, frankly, some of these teams, guys, some of these teams' biggest flaws, though, even the ones that are in like that are four or five or six seeds, some of their biggest flaws are their inability to score the basketball for, for five or six minute stretches. Mm -hmm. you, you're never going to see Alabama miss 10 shots in a row. You just won't. You, you, you're not going to see it. There's too many ways for them to get one. Yeah, mm -hmm. look at look at the win over the weekend. Jaden Bradley, Rylan Griffin. They they have different ways that they could beat you, guys that really step up. But like to me, this is a bigger picture discussion. This is a, a discussion, Rob, about Nate Oates, about a guy who was a, a high school coach 10, 11 years ago, and and now is sitting here as the coach of Alabama, and honestly. He's built them up that if you are a blue blood down the road, if you, I'm not saying that Texas is getting him either, but like they're going to, they'll try to call him. I don't think he'll take their call, but you never know. My point is, this is the guy we've been talking about coaching stars. What's there not to like about this guy? He is Didn't sort of the American. a massive extension. Yeah, yeah, but that money doesn't matter, man. That money doesn't matter. The, the places that places that Nate is going to end up going if he goes somewhere are going to be Texas, who has an endless supply of cash, or Michigan, Kentucky, Kentucky, who has an endless supply of cash, or Michigan, Michigan who has an endless supply of cash. Like the places that he's going, money money is irrelevant to these people. To I think programs. he's he's got that face potential. Like we talk about, because you know what it is. It's not just yep. it's not just that he's winning, right? And it's not just that he's playing. Um, that he's bringing in these five-star recruits. It's not that you have like a little bit of NBA pedigree there. Um, it's that he's playing a style of basketball that people want to watch. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, as good as Houston is, as much as they win, it's not exactly the prettiest brand of basketball. Like you go to a game and you're winning, you know, you're holding teams to 40 points and, you know, you're doing a lot of your work on defense and on the offensive glass and the transition transition like that's going to get the job done, but Perfect you're not exactly Alabama. watching that. And it's like exciting. Right. But imagine putting, Imagine taking what NATO says offensively, putting that in front of 24,000 people at Rupp Arena, in front of a fan base that loves oh, yeah. Yeah. the you know that style of basketball more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to go nuts. They're going to love them. There's there. a lot to be said there. It, the it, I compared a little bit. I had this conversation the other day. Like we when I played in Sweden, we we had a, a team. We led the world in scoring per 40 minutes, and that's not a lot. We we led the world in scoring per 40 minutes. We also led the world <laughs> led the world. <laughs> in like worse defense per 40 minutes because the games would end like a buck 10 to a buck 08 
This was like, a team that you were on? Yeah, in regulation. I'm shocked. I in am regulation. shocked. We the had team that you were so, on, all they did was score and they didn't defend. I am it shocked. It was so much fun. But the thing was, was we were in a town that didn't know basketball. <laughs> so what you do is you make the game aesthetically pleasing. It's fast. It's fun. There's a lot of threes. There's a lot going. Like, it's, it's, it's fun to watch. And in a basket in a football town like Alabama or in Tuscaloosa, <laughs> like people can get behind that because the energy's there. So when people go to games, they feel like they're a part of it. Mm-hmm. Like to where it's Houston, it's like it's a drag, and and gosh, it's like oh my, it's like a it's like a hard day's work sometimes watching that team if they're not playing offensively. They still win, but it's like it's different whenever you're winning eighty eight to. 75 as opposed to you know 52 to 46 which i'm not saying houston can't score they're very good at scoring as well but it's a different way of going about it that's why his style has fit alabama very well for their fan base yeah the the one question i would have with Al- with with nato it's in a place like a kentucky is you have to be a different breed to be able to deal with that level of spotlight right and i'm not saying that nate can't I think they could do that easily. I don't I just don't he's never he's never done it. Like I thought I thought Mac would be able to handle Louisville, right? And he was at Louisville and obviously there was like a there's other level. things going on there though. Yeah, there's I, a, lot, I, I, a lot of other stuff going on, but it's just you can't really know until you get into that fishbowl, right? And so that's the kind of thing like if I, if I had one hesitation it's that he's never been in a place where he is the focal point to a level that he would be the focal point at Kentucky. Everything else lines up. And that's you just the what? one where I'm like, well, I kind of got to see that one to, to see it happen. And that's that's with pretty much anybody that has never dealt with being at a program like that before. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I, it does make sense. But you know what? Kentucky needs to get away from the face of the program and being the head coach. At the end of the day, Kentucky's about bringing in the best of the best talent and letting yeah, them. Yeah, but it's co- that's never going to happen in college. In college, the face of the program is always going to be because that's where you get the consistency and the longevity. That's it's a good just, point. Yeah, I, just, yeah but I, 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 I look at their coaches. The face of you, yeah. you look at their great coaches like Patino, face of the pro- program. Rupp, face of the program. Like that's just that's just what's that's not happen. my point. My, my that's not my point. My point is is that um, it, you you don't need to have this larger than life personality to win Mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's about wins it's about Mm -hmm. winning basketball games and if you get somebody as superb as brandon miller when people think of alabama this year they don't think of natos i mean not first they think of brandon miller that's that's what they're thinking about if if people are saying oh yeah they got that one and done kid that's that's at least my school thought when mick cronin took the job at ucla ucla is not kentucky or duke or kansas in 2023 it's just not but when Mick Cronin took the job at UCLA, everybody said, can he handle L.A. life? Is he Los Angeles? Is he Westwood? Like, does he actually – he don't give a damn. His mm. teams his teams just play hard. You Mick, know what's Mick funny? He's, he's, none of the, he's none of those things, and it still worked. Like, all of those concerns That's were valid. That's my point. <laughs> he found a way to get it done. <laughs> Sometimes we – I do think that with Cal – because of a period of he's perfect for Kentucky, he is Kentucky, he's the CEO, he's crushing it in recruiting. Kentucky recruits itself, and it will continue to recruit itself. If Nate Oates is leading Kentucky, if he could recruit to Alabama, he could recruit to Kentucky. Whoever Kentucky's going to hire is probably good enough to get kids, or else they wouldn't be hired by the <laughs> Kentucky Wildcats. Whoever gets it next. My point is, I do think with John Calipari that we've fallen into this whole thing of, and and not we, but like, I think they look at it as, yeah, number one recruiting class again next year. So can you really do anything about that? Can you really? Well, okay. If it wasn't number one, what are the chances that it wouldn't be in the top five at the very least? And oh, by the way, how much have those top ranked recruiting classes really mattered? Over the last three or four years, the answer to that question is they really have not ended up mattering. So I, we we have got to value winning overall. And for me, Nate Oates is a guy that comes from a place of humility, and I would love him at Kentucky. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to write him away from Alabama, but I just think that this guy is the future. He's one of those candidates for face. College basketball does need faces from the coaching perspective. There's clearly an open door right now. 
And when we're talking about guys that are going to be up for some of these big time jobs down the road, whether jobs open, whether certain head coaches that might be early in their tenure at a respective job might not be the one for that job. Um, you know, whoever it ends up being, Nate Oates could be a guy. Who are you talking about there, Fanta? Who are you talking about? Guys that not might not be their job early in the tenure. Who who are you people, talking about? You're gonna say specifics? You're gonna put names on that? <laughs> people can make conclusions however they want to make conclusions. Yeah. All right. So let's get into uh the meat of today. For what it's show. worth, for what it's worth, uh, who I think Fanta's talking about. I'm pretty sure I called this one two games in. Oh yeah. my gosh. Two games in. Uh, it was the second game we watched it, and I was like, I'm not sure this guy's it. Well, you know, okay, all right. Don't do not do the victory lap here, Q. Now, there's no victory lap because I want yeah. him to succeed. There's no, no victory okay. lap because I want yeah. him to succeed. Did you know two dates in that your wife, you know, was the one you had? Yeah, in? yeah. All right. I just yeah. had to pry her out of the arms of her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> all right. So, so he's two. Well, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's interesting. I hope your right. pasta was. I hope now you guys pasta... say I don't play defense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Your your meatballs delivered more than his. Um, <laughs> here's, you know here's what it was, Tio. You know what it was. She saw those luscious eyebrows that you have, yeah. and she was like, "I know hey, they weren't making fun of my eyebrows yeah. last night on the yeah, show." Yeah. I, yeah, that was the weirdest thing. I, I don't know why they were making fun. That I've never had anyone. Make, I feel like I just have like the blandest non-committal eyebrows ever. <laughs> At least hey, I, at least I have them, T.O. At least I have them. <laughs> Can I bring this guy down from planet, whatever planet he's on right now? Which hey, which Ter- guy? Me or T.O.? No, not you. You're fine today. Hey, Ter- <laughs> hey, Me? Terrence. Yeah, huh. yeah, you, you. Okay. What is? Oh. What you? We went out. What'd you say? I said, "What does Kobe Jones do well?" Oh yeah, he's. He, hey, look, that has less to do with him. Like apparently, he could shoot. Apparently he could shoot, but here's the thing about Kobe Jones. This year he's getting good shots. Credit to Sean Miller and Sule Boom. <laughs> you're right. So you're, you're right. You're it, right. It was, that was you're a right. plot. That, but see, here's the, oh, here's the thing. I wasn't the only person asking that question because whenever I talked to certain NBA scouts, you, it was you like were, you were the only person asking nope. that question because everybody else was like, yeah, Kobe yeah. Jones breakout star Kobe Jones he's going to be the yeah. guy for Xavier this year all I did was ask everybody else knows. was right everybody, everybody else, was else right. yeah everybody else was right all right the no world was right yeah no good you're, 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 you're unnamed yeah. anonymous NBA scouts that you talk to yeah Goodman had that was, that's a, that was a concern like there's a lot of dudes six six in the NBA that do a lot of things no I mean good good is this the NBA here. right now no it's not months? but that was my question Doster. <laughs> no, Good, Goodman had it. Rothstein had it. Terrence Greenberg had it. Like, everybody yeah. had this. Everybody. Seth, I talked with Seth last week. He had Kobe Jones being a, a an All-American way before you, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. He had a... Uh... He, he knew Purdue was happening three years ago, right? Like, he saw it come in, and he's <laughs> like, just watch. As soon as they get rid of Jaden Ivey, as soon as they get rid of Trevion Williams, that's all they got to do. Then they're going to be the best team in college basketball. <laughs> Smartest man, the smartest man in the sport right there. All right, let's get into the meat of today's show. What I want to do is I want to go through each conference um, and just talk to who we think is the the most dangerous team when you get into March. Um, I'm going to set the timer on this one because I know with you renegades, per we'll conference, never, we'll never get anything done because mm-hmm. people like T.O., as I'm trying to get rolling, will just keep cutting me off. That's what will <laughs> happen. So I'm going to set the timer. We're going to do the timer. We're going to do it old school. We're going to start. With the conference that everybody loves here, the Big East. T.O., going to you first. You got Marquette. You got Creighton. You got Xavier. You got Providence. You got UConn. You even got Villanova, Seton Hall, St. John's. Who is best built for making a run in March out of that league? I'm back on the Blue Jays. I'm back on the Blue Jays. Kyle Printer's back in, back in action. Uh, he's improved their defense tremendously. Creighton's got the 12th best defense in the country, according to Ken Palm. And they have shot making, they have guard play, and they're peaking at the right time. That's a big thing, too. Like, it's okay to, like, go through a slump in December and January. That's fine. It it expedites your learning process for your guys. And what happens? You get healthy. You figure it out. Guys find their roles quicker because you're losing. Something's got to change. It's easier to preach what, what needs to be done whenever you're losing. Because sometimes you win, and some of the things, the small things that you're doing wrong get swept under the rug because you won. Creighton got smacked in the mouth early in the season, but the talent was still there. 
Arthur Columa is still there. Baylor Shireman's still there. Trey Alexander's still there. Like they still have pieces that could make a run in March. Fanta. <laughs> Yeah, I, I look at it. Creighton to me is the best team in this league and the team that's most poised to make the run in March, which shouldn't come as a surprise because we did believe that they would be a top 10 worthy team. And you think about what they've been able to do here in winning eight in a row. It's their longest winning streak in conference play since 2011 12, since they were in the Missouri Valley Conference back then. Trey Alexander on Saturday was the reason why Creighton beat Connecticut, combined with the Blue Jays' great defense. But in a game that was such a defensive war, 56-53, and by the way, I was encouraged by Connecticut. I'll get to them in a second because I I just thought that they fought hard and, and that there's something there. However, Alexander's degree of difficulty on his shot making was absurd. I mean, he had 17 points on six of eight from the floor, and at least four of those six made shots were difficult, were contested mm. jumpers late in the shot clock. He hit Over the two last... ridiculous ones in the first half, and it was just like, how the fuck did that go in? That's right. Over two the last 13 shots. games, Alexander has averaged 16 points, and when you have Ryan Nemhard, who's third in the Big East at assists with 5.3 dishes per game, yeah, and yeah. Ryan Kalkbrenner, who's one of the nation's leading field goal percentage guys with 73% of his shots being makes, Look, they, they've they got it. They've got it. Now, what's interesting in this conference this year is, okay, well, you've got five ranked in the AP Top 25. It's not just Creighton and everybody else. No, it's actually Marquette who finds himself in the driver's seat. So you're really saying here, okay, Marquette, Xavier, Providence, then UConn. And I still put UConn in the mix. Who after that, who after Creighton's most dangerous to make the run in March? I'm saying Connecticut, and I say that because they have figured certain things out. They're guarding better. They went through some defensive lapses. I like the fact that this late in the season, they have a week in between games. Mm -hmm. They don't have a midweek game. That's a good thing for a team like Connecticut, in my opinion, because it gives them a chance to get back in the lab and work on themselves yeah there's there's one thing that they've done and they've they've tweaked some things to find ways to be able to use andre jackson offensively one of the things they did against creighton was uh they would set a cross screen for sonogo with him get sonogo up to the to the high post about 17 feet away from the at the foul line and then run down screens on either side of the floor using andre jackson to let adama go one-on-one and create um and adama skilled enough to do that Uh, i reiterating all your points it's it's creighton to me there's two reasons that really stand out one Multiple shot makers, multiple playmakers, multiple guys that can get you one at the end of a possession, at the end of a clock. To you, that's your favorite thing to say, right? When things go bad, you need a guy that can get you one. Yep. They got three of them. Yep. Um, the other thing is, if you look at what they've done since Kalkbrenner got back from his illness, they've been a top three team in America over the course of the last six weeks. Yes. If you, if you go and look yep. at their stuff on Torvik, they are the third best team in America mm-hmm. over that stretch. And not well, only are they elite defensively, but they don't foul. Right. And one of the, they, they're, they're not deep. They, they basically have five guys and then everyone else you can kind of cycle through to get someone to blow. One of the concerns is what happens if you get in foul trouble, you got to go to the bench. Right. Well, they don't foul. You can't shot four it. three free throws. And it was all because Trey Alexander was chasing Jordan Hawkins and fouled him on two three pointers. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason why they yeah. shot free throws. So um, they're great defensively. They don't let you get good shots. They don't foul you they don't put you on the free throw line they got different guys that can make things uh make plays for you just they're a very very good basketball team i think they're going to make a run they're going to prove us all right all right nothing for marquette there i love them love marquette love shaka marquette and xavier to me the concern is the defensive end and if the shots aren't going in how do you win games and over the course of a six game you attack stretch, the rim well they, over the course of a six game stretch you're going to have games where you're not great offensively. And I just don't think they can win a game when they're not great offensively. They're good. I think Marquette's a second weekend team. Yeah, well, I like Well, let me tell you something. Hey, narratives and whatnot in the Big East, this is a very important season for the Big East, important March for the Big East. This is one of the best shots for the conference to get three teams to the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. That has not happened. That has not happened in the new Big East, and this is year 10. So I will say this about perception and all that. We talk about March performance. This is a, an important year. Again, Marquette, I know people are always – their jaws always drop when when this stat is said. You guys have heard it from me before. They have not won an NCAA tournament game in a decade. 
So that drought needs to end this year. Because, Terrence, to your point, I don't think they're good enough to win five games in the NCAA tournament. I'm not even sure, I'm not sure about four. That team can win two games in the NCAA tournament. They're, they are dangerous. And Tyler Kolick has 201 assists in 25 basketball games. So, look, they're, 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 they're a dangerous team. The, the thing that Rob says is what happens if they start to go through an offensive rut? Can they make up for it? But I'll tell you what, Wednesday night, 7 Eastern time, from the Five Sir Forum, Marquette hosts Xavier. And yeah. for you for you basketball huge, fans out there. It's a huge there, Big East week. We got Marquette, yeah. Xavier uh, tomorrow, and tonight we have Creighton at Providence. By the way, Providence is getting points at home. I'm probably going to have to be on Providence in that spot. 34 and 1 in their last 35 games in Amica Mutual Pavilion slash Dunkin' Donuts Center. 34 it's the dunk. It's the dunk. One. Don't say the other thing. It's the dunk. It's the dunk on this one. podcast. It could be the other thing anywhere else. When you're on Fox, you could say the other thing. When you're on the DTF podcast, it's the dunk. Haven't lost at home this year. <laughs> All right. Hey, haven't. hey, I saw a great I saw a great thing. Uh, these guys at Slapping Glass. Have you guys watched that? What Marquette yes. does. They they are so good. They they do a really nice job. But they uh I know they're not part of our network, but I felt like it needed to be said. Like they they broke down Marquette's uh, basically opening to their offense and how they're using the slots as opposed to the forty five and spacing out everything and attacking certain guys and put. I mean, it's it's really tough to guard because you're constantly chasing. It's like a pistol into a ball screen, but it's in the slot as opposed to the forty five. So everything's in the middle of the floor, and like Tyler Kolick is such a good decision maker at that spot, and it they're using different spots on the floor than I think people are accustomed to seeing. So it's tougher to guard. Like they, they do some interesting things. It's a good thing. I like to use the timer on this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting league. It really is. And and it's an important year for Marquette. I think that people have had trust issues with them in March fellas. So now is the time for them to turn that corner. Shaka smarts talked about that, that they've got to play their best. At the most important time they, they got right against Georgetown. They're in the driver's seat at 12 and three in the Big East. If there was yeah. ever a get right game. If there was ever yeah, a get right game. That's it's... right. Hey, keep an eye. To my my bold prediction in the Big East, we're going to turn the page to semifinal Friday at the Big East tournament, and Villanova will still be standing. Yeah, I agree. But I've been yelled at for having that opinion before. So, all right, let's move to the Big 12. We got Texas up top. We got Baylor up top. We have Kansas, a half game out of first place. Iowa State, Kansas State, Oklahoma State are all uh, one game out of first in the loss column. Then you have TCU, who is still a top 15 to 20 team when they are healthy. T.O., I'm going to you first. Out of everybody in this league, who do you think is the best suited to being able to find a way to make a run in the NCAA tournament? They're 10-1 and one in their last 11. The Baylor Bears, Scott Drew, the guard play. And if you get matched up against a mid-major that's feeling some kind of way, that's playing really well, they match up with them. And you see what they're doing in conference play. They're 9-4 and four in the Big 12, toughest, uh, toughest uh, conference in college basketball. Like, they can play against bigger teams. Jam Chachua coming back is huge. The fact that he's even playing, Doster, you alluded to it yet last night. Like, mm -hmm. it's amazing, really. But he brings an edge, and they have that elite talent. They really do. Keontae George is that elite talent. Does he get along with everything that uh, Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer are supposed to do? No, he's got a little bit of a I'm the man here kind of mm -hmm. air about him, which I, I'm not mad at. I'm not, I, I don't want that to be construed as a bad thing. I want that to be understood that that's a good thing. And you need a guy like that who's got a little bit of an edge to him that's willing to take it on his shoulders. And uh, I, I think Keontae George is that. Their forward spot is not as good as what it's been in the past few years. That's the thing that kind of throws me off. Like there is no Matthew Meyer. There, are, you know what I mean. Like there's they're not, not guarding the same way either. That that's that's my. But like I said, that I think, I, like I said last night, I think that has a little bit to do with Keontae a little bit. Yeah, it might because might, the I, other guys are rotating. There's been times where he's standing straight up watching, and the ball's on the other side, and something happens, and he's not able to get where he's supposed to be. Um, so a little one, one, three, two. So that was good. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that team. Uh, I, I think the guard talent there is elite, elite. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see, Fanta, how it kind of develops with uh, with Chan Wachachwa back. Um, where do you stand? Are you on Baylor, too? For the sake of being contrarian. Okay, there we go. I'm still going to go with Kansas State. Ooh. Kansas State, to me, is, is a dangerous team still. I think just because they've lost three of four, we've cooled off. 
a little bit uh, on on the Wildcats, but I, I also think that's part of life in the Big Twelve, guys. Like, I, you can't cool off too heavily on a team just because they're you know taking lumps in the best conference in college basketball, which is going to send seven, eight teams to the NCAA tournament in a ten-team league. Marquise Noel just does so many things when and when he's on, he's the type of guy. Noel and Keontae Johnson are the types of dudes that when you say, can they win these games, three, four, five games in a row, could they get on that type of run? Well, they defend. Mm. So you know that you can count on that. And Noel and Johnson are the type of guys that can get hot. And we know in the NCAA tournament, once you get hot, you could stay hot. And I, I just love the vibe of this team. I think the, the losses recently are going to help them. I'm still bullish on what they can do from a defensive perspective. I, I think they're a team. Scoring depth is a bit of an issue. There's no question about that. So when you don't have complementary scoring at a high level, I get a little bit nervous about that. But um, I, I'm still in on Naquan Tomlin. I, I like the role that he plays for this team. He can rebound the basketball well for them. And he, and he does a does some things defensively that kind of make it difficult to face him. Make you say, wow. He does some things defensively that make you say, wow. Yeah, he does. He does. So they're, they're a team that I'm still in on. And I just think in a year that in the year that they've had, they might be, and and for all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. Iowa State could be there again. But they might be the team that going into the NCAA tournament, some people have cooled off of on. But you shouldn't forget about what they collectively did throughout December and January, because typically that comes back around the corner once we hit March Madness. And I just think Kansas State's going to be right there in a Sweet 16. And guys, would you want to see Jerome Tang and that group motivated at that juncture of the season? I know I would, and I know that those fans would travel for the tournament. So I'm I'm going to... I'm going to be bullish here and say that one of those teams that aren't the main brands could go end up going on a run. Kansas State is a team that I'm going to take the torch for and lead. Yeah, so I think uh, – I love the Kansas State call. Um, but I'm going to stick with Texas because I think okay. Texas has the best combination of good guards and the ability to get stops, right? I It feels weird not picking Kansas. Um, I just – it's very hard for me to wrap my mind around a team that has – basically one guy that can be a go-to guy in in terms of uh of um Jalen Wilson. So I'll go with I'll go with Texas. Marcus Carr has proven himself to me. Um I think that they've been a little bit better defensively uh in recent weeks. Um and I'm not worried about losing what have they lost? Three of their last six, two of their last three. Mm-hmm. I'm not worried about losing at Tennessee. I'm not worried about losing at Kansas. The one the loss at Texas Tech is a little bit mm-hmm. worrying, but like that's also a rivalry game. Yeah. Did you see this the 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 posters they had there, by the way? They had a they had a big head. You know the big heads that students print out? They had a big head of Chris Beard's mugshot um behind the basket, which was uh exactly what you would expect from TO's people, TO's folks down there in Lubbock. So I'll I'll be on Texas here. Um I can't believe none of us said Kansas. That's pretty wild. It tells you I, it, to know about they, the they just have such a standard, like it wouldn't just it would just wouldn't surprise anybody. Yep. Like um all right. Indiana, I'm sorry, the Big Ten. <laughs> I think I gave my, my way so who do you think? This one. <laughs> so I might as well just go first. I think Indiana, if they, not if, when they get Xavier Johnson back, you got a team that has two guards, you got a team that is defending, and you got a team that has arguably the hottest player in college basketball right now, and Trace Jackson Davis, who's been an absolute monster. Uh, they're 18-7 and seven overall. They're 9-5 and five in the Big Ten. They still got a game um at purdue they still have a chance to find a way to win this league uh so i'll i'll be on um indiana here i think that their role players have kind of figured out what their roles are you know miller cop is making some shots uh trey galloway i think is one of kind of the the unsung glue guys whatever cliche you want to plug in there like that dude just Mm -hmm. knows how to make winning plays um race thompson is back and, and contributing tomorrow bates is a guy making shots so i like i like what mike woodson has there i like what he has there but i will say this I think your take, T.O., on the Big Ten at the start of the year is going to end up proving correct, where I think there's going to be a lot of teams that kind of underwhelm a little bit when we kind of get into the NCAA tournament and we get in March. Like there, are, There's a reason why a lot of these teams weren't very good 
in non-conference play, right? And now we're gassing them up because they won a bunch of games. Northwestern is second in the conference right now, and they lost two starters to Blue Bloods last season. It says all you need and to say. And those starters right? have not lit the world on fire. Yeah, addition by subtraction. Please, yeah. please do not disrespect No Neck Ryan Young on the DTF podcast. I will not stand for that. No Neck Ryan Young. He's got no neck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look at him. Okay. Like his, his shoulders go straight to his head. If he had a neck, he'd be seven foot two. That's what makes him so effective. No one realizes like his shoulders. If you watch him stand next to Kyle Filipowski, his shoulders are higher than Kyle, Kyle Filipowski. He's like Bonzi Colson. Remember Bonzi Colson? Was that back yes. in your day, T.O.? Yeah, Notre Dame, yeah. yeah. Only you would so know. So whenever that. Ryan Young turns, you're like, hey, Ryan. He... <laughs> yeah, that's what he does. <laughs> Got okay. no neck. No. <laughs> now no that neck. I've said it, now that I've mentioned it to you, next time you see him, you're not going to be able to not notice it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. He does uh, look like he's like college basketball's dad bod. Like he's totally a <laughs> he yeah. is. He's totally a dad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that with all the young kids that are on Duke's team too that are all gangly, and he's like a grown man that looks like he just left Animal House. <laughs> all right. Like I got Indiana. Who you got, T.O.? <laughs> uh just everybody understands Purdue, so I'm not going Purdue. Uh, we we all understand that they're legit national title contenders, Purdue. But for the sake of the argument, another team, and I've I've, I've been pretty consistent in this, guys. Illinois, like they match up well, getting some good guard play. Coleman Hawkins yep. is playing well against non directional schools. Um, it's like it's important, and like he gives them some versatility uh, on the offensive end. That's really impressive guys. I mean, he, when he's really good, he looks like an all American when he's not really good. He, you're wondering where he's at, if he's playing hide and seek or something, but they have the lineup versatility, uh, on that Illinois team and they're playing better, uh, as of late, but it's like, they, they have so many different ways they could beat you. I thought the Rutgers game was a litmus test for Illinois and they passed with, uh, flying colors. Almost double figures. Like, mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that they can go small and quick and switch. Mm -hmm. And I also like the fact that you can throw Dane Danger in there. He can guard an opposing five. Um, not named Trace Jackson. How Davis. many teams in college basketball have the ability to play that big and also play that positionless? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. But it's, not a, many. No, it's a legitimate question. Like, uh, is there, I, I don't know if there are any that have the ability to switch the way that Illinois has the ability to switch. I would say that Miami has a shot. Because God, Norchad or Mir can guard bigger guys at six you seven. This, you love this dude. Every every time that I've talked to you, somehow you get Norchad or Mir into the conversation. Is well, I think it has more to do with the fact that I really want to pronounce his name right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a solid goal of mine. I want to get it right. Uh, no, that's a hard one. That, that they they pose a lot of challenges for a lot of people. Yep, Fanta, who you got? Kansas well, State could. Kansas State could do that. Yeah, they take the five man one, out. But Tennessee's put... just not very good, huh? Tennessee's another one. Yeah, they're just huge though. Their their, their defense is predicated on being massive. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you, you got to play complementary basketball. And of the teams you just listed, Illinois is able to do both. Right. They, they can switch, and on the other side, they've gotten better. They they've become more of a team. I mean, Illinois' mm -hmm. issues early in the year were clearly some egos and. Underwood just not getting through to his guys. It feels like whatever ended up happening, whether it was a fireside chat, whether it was Underwood yelling, he's had a fiery year from a personality standpoint. I think Brad's been frustrated, Terrence. <laughs> yeah. I think Brad's been frustrated because he knew how talented the team could be. Yeah, absolutely. That that's it. You know, when you're when you've got an average team and you're sort of just hanging in, I think as a coach, you're like, Yeah, this is what my team is. Like the the reality has set in. This is who we are. To me, Brad Underwood's frustration is part of who Brad is, but also part of like he did tell us in the preseason he felt that this group was more suited to win when it mattered most yeah. because he felt like they could defend multiple positions. They could score. So I second you with Illinois. I think that they're the team that that is dangerous from a talent perspective. They've got a lead guard in Terrence Shannon. You said it. Hawkins has progressed. Dane Danger and Matthew Meyer have been – Credit to Underwood for doing the simplistic thing of saying, I'm just going to take winning. He took Baylor players who were winners. Danger wasn't a part of that sample size, but he's a winning player. 
Matthew Meyer has been fantastic. When Meyer scores in double figures this year, Illinois has won almost every game. I mean, they they have – he swings them. Mm-hmm. So – and I like their freshmen. I mean, I, I think that, that Jaden Epps has done good things for them. So I second you with Illinois. What I would say is this. You know, I, I, I'm with Rob on the Big Ten take to a degree <clears> – <throat> But the only way to know is that's the randomness of the tournament. You know, the the Big Ten could end up getting a couple of teams to the Sweet 16, and maybe two of them are facing teams that that ended up pulling an an upset off in the first round, and then you're looking at it and saying, well, there's a mismatch there. That's that's part of the randomization of of the NCAA tournament. My Mm -hmm. my follow, my final thought on the Big Ten is this. You know, I I really I think that Northwestern will win a first round game. I don't know what they'll do beyond that. I think so too. But I I really like them. I mean, I I think that the Wildcats and here's why. They're only allowing 62 points per game. So they're not going to get blown out. They they they're, they're going to the, however the game goes if it's an 8-9 game or a 7-10 game, but whatever it is, you know it's going to be tight. And Chase Audij is a big time leader. I mean, yeah. he just steps up when they need him to boo booey. Did you see boo booey in the locker room after that win on Sunday? We got more to prove mm. he, that guy's a killer and he's been around the block. He's been there forever. He bet on Northwestern. He stayed with Northwestern when he could have been a portal guy and he wasn't Ty Berry's gotten better. Uh, Robbie B gotten better. Brooks Barnheiser to me was the key to the win over Ohio state. Ohio state's not very good, but Barnheiser on a night where Northwestern was looking for offense. Barnheiser couldn't miss. I like them to win a tournament game. I don't know how much further they get beyond that, but man, the Wildcats are nine and five in this league for a reason. They're a thorn in people's side because they really guard. And guys, I, we gotta we gotta pay more respect to this on Sunday. With less than four minutes to go in that game, they're down fifty five to forty seven. The game looked over. It looked done with. They finished that game against Purdue on a seventeen to three run that is crazy good for chris collins good for the wildcats the people of evanston deserve a good time yep all right let's move to the sec the fighting Uh, kevin sweeney's yeah the fighting kevin sweeney's let's move to the sec you are not allowed to say alabama for this answer because everybody knows alabama is the answer i think they are the one team in college basketball that is the best built for making a run in march so can't say that to the sec Mm. who Uh Out of that league, non-Alabama category is best suited to make a run in March. Nick Smith's coming back for Arkansas. Yeah. Um, they That's certainly the could, and they've That's made the two straight Elite Eights. But, That's like, he is a kind of talented kid that, like, could get you back to a third one. And if Musk knows one thing, it's how to win in the tournament. I mean, he's exhibited that pretty consistently. Uh, they have talent. I mean, obviously, the losses of uh, – Smith and Trayvon Brazil have played huge roles and they don't necessarily have the great rim protector in the same form, but they figured out ways uh, to be effective. I mean, they're still guarding at a high rate. One of the best defenses in the country, top 20 defense in the country, and they have length all over the place. Uh, Ricky counts with the fort. Like that's one of the guys. He's another guy that has, you know, transferred in. Nobody really knew. And buddy, he has exploded onto the scene, and I think he's one of the guys that have been a, that has been the beneficiary of Nick Smith being hurt. Like he got a lot more tick, he got a lot more opportunity, and now you're adding Smith back into the mix, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Uh, like the talent level on that team certainly suggests that Arkansas can make a run. Yeah, I agree. I, to me, it's it's Arkansas, Arkansas, Arkansas is the clear answer. Uh, no Texas A and M. No, no Texas A&M to me. Um, they got to get in the tournament first. Uh, the reason it's Arkansas is because I think Muss is the kind of coach that's built for that situation, right? Mm-hmm. That's built for uh, one-off tournament runs. That's built for being able to figure out where you have an advantage, where you have a mismatch, and just going yeah. at it every single time over and over yeah. and over again. And to me, Fanta, he's got three guys that can go win any matchup that you put them in. Ricky Council, Anthony Black, and now that he's back, Nick Smith. 
Yeah, I, I think Arkansas is the answer here. But if I was going to argue somebody else for, for the sake of arguing, I'm still going to go with Missouri and Dennis Gates. And, and I think that that's a team that has shown that they can beat the elite. They can beat great teams that win over Iowa State in the SEC Big 12 Challenge was really, really impressive. The Tigers have now won five of their last six. And I love the way that Dennis Gates recruited uh, from the portal. I mean, what he was able to do in, in getting DeAndre Golston and getting Des Moy Hodge, Nick Connor as well, uh, they just got pieces that fit together. They really did. And to me, Colby Brown is the guy who makes this all work. And what a great NCAA tournament story it would be for a guy that stayed with Missouri, that didn't leave, that stayed committed to them through some really bad basketball. Mm. If Brown's then in an NCAA tournament victory celebrating that, that's a full circle type of thing. That's what you stay committed to your school to do. So, hey, what you like about Dennis Gates in year one is that they do have different dudes who can go get buckets and who can fill it up. And they've got double-figure scores. They've got guys who, who can make that happen on a given night. That was a very, very impressive win at Tennessee. It came in dramatic fashion over the weekend. Heartbreak for the Volunteers. I mean, it's, it's amazing, guys. Here we are talking on this Tuesday, on Valentine's Day, and three or four weeks ago we were talking about Tennessee and are they a legitimate national title threat but their true colors have shown because frankly mm -hmm. um, they're hard to trust at times and they don't really have that go-to guy down the stretch in games. So Missouri is a team that it feels like a magical year. I think there's, there's merit to it. I think it's real. I like the tigers here mm -hmm. to potentially make that second weekend. And for some people to be surprised, but I know we won't because the thing is they identified kids that are experienced and that impact winning and they don't rely on one player to win. Dennis Gates really has some different guys, and they guard. They're, they're a willing defensive team. That was an amazing moment. Every great season has a moment where you take a game from the jaws of defeat and you find a way to win. That Golston three is a, is a moment for Missouri that we could end up looking back on as, yeah, what just a magical season for them. That was incredible on it's Saturday. Pretty, it's pretty wild when you think about it that none of us picked Tennessee. None of us picked Auburn, and none of us picked Kentucky to be the team that makes a run in March. Kentucky's actually got to get again. You got to make. You, you got to give yeah. Dennis Gates credit, like tremendously, yeah. though, because it, I talked to um, Rob Lanier, uh, who's in his first season at SMU, and he's like, he's like, sometimes coaches will walk into a situation, and guys will stay around, and they'll be the beneficiary of guys coming together under a new regime and all that stuff that's not the case at Mizzou. Like he walked into Kobe Brown. That was pretty much it. Like Isaiah Mosley yeah. transferred in. That's right. Terrence. DeAndre Golson, Golson came from Milwaukee. Noah Carter came from, I think Northern Iowa. Like yeah. Des Moy Hodge followed him over. Sean East was the Juco player of the year last year. Like it's a bunch of guys. Like he put this team together. This is not something like he just walked into and they weren't very good last year. And yeah. the fact that he's been able to put them together so fast has been the wildest part about it is the guy that was supposed to be their best transfer, Isaiah Mosley, has like been in and out of the lineup. He didn't play a couple times. He's played, then he hasn't played, then he's been back, then he hasn't been playing. He missed a month, then he drops 20, then he doesn't play. Like it's just it's been a roller coaster year. Um, but the one thing that they have done is remain consistent in their ability to kind of execute and, and, be and he brought his guys they, over, he brought his culture with him, like Trey Gomelian's uh, transfer yes. with him from Cleveland State. Yeah, but uh, and, and it's not just that. Like, Cleveland State. I think he kind of set a tone where he said, like, look, we got this kid coming in who's one of the best shooters in all of college basketball, but he ain't on board. So, like, he ain't playing. You know, that's right. Sit your ass down. And I think that when you, one, when you when you kind of set that tone with someone that's supposed to be one of your most talented guys, and two, you got a bunch of dudes in that program that kind of buy into your culture, it kind of it's going to set the tone. It's going to create a culture, and it's, it's the way that you can kind of flip it uh, relatively quickly. All right, T.O., we're heading to your conference, to your favorite conference. I know we've called you a Big Ten guy. I know we've called you a Big East guy, but at your heart, you Going are, Big 12 next year. Going Big you are, 12 you are a, At your heart, you are a Pac-12 guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, uh, the ACC, Virginia's in first place. Tied with Pitt, which is one of the most unexpected things, I think, in college basketball this year. Miami is a game out of first. Uh, you have Clemson, a game out of first. You have NC State, 
two games out of first place. Wake Forest is there. Duke is there. Syracuse is there. You got to get all the way down to ninth to get to North Carolina. Out of everybody in this league, who is best suited to be able to make a run in the NCAA tournament? Guys, there's a few. There's. I'm going to be honest. Like we're down on the ACC. Kim Palm's got in the seventh best conference and all that, but there's still three or four teams that can make a run. There's still three or four teams that can make a run to the Elite Eight. Give me one. We're, Give me one. I, Don't I say give, Miami. Don't say Miami. I'm I'll not going to say Miami. Miami. I, mean, yeah. I think we forget it. I, we've just a little bit like Fanta described Houston in that we know what they are. We're used to them. They're just consistent. They do what they do. They know exactly what they're doing. You know exactly what they're doing, and they just freaking win, baby. That's Virginia. And they just keep doing it year after year after year. Uh, they, they have scoring options – in a lot of different spots. Like Armand Franklin hit a big shot against Duke the other day. They have Kihei Clark that organizes everybody. Reese Beekman's that explosive guard with the ball in his hands. Jaden Gardner is uh, ACC Barkley. Like, they've got guys. He is ACC Barkley. Go watch his game. He's Barkley. Uh, they, they, they've got guys that can score it when they need a bucket. They've got their, – their defense is always going to guard. It's 22nd in the country, but at the same time, it's like, according to Kim Palm, uh, it, it's it's a team that we've gotten bored with their consistency. And they're still really good. And they still have a chance to not only make an Elite Eight, they have a chance to make a Final Four. Yep. Fanta? Yeah, I, UCLA for me. Uh, would ACC. Be, ACC. ACC. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's Valentine's Day. You have your mind on other things. Your All right, while, while you think, he has his mind on his meatballs. No, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. I keep – I, he had, he had his mind, like, I keep going. I keep going second or third in this, so I'm I'm forgetting which conference we're talking about. Go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I'm not going to say Miami because I think Miami's the obvious choice. Great guards made a previous run. Laranag is built for uh, March. I'm going to go with NC State. I like that too. Um, I I love the presence of DJ Burns. I think the fact that they can kind of pressure and turn you over is going to be something that's a little bit tough when you get into those like short turnaround games right like it's it's difficult to kind of prepare for stuff like that i don't typically love pressing teams but i do think that they can give you a jolt if you're not ready for it and you haven't seen it before and frankly if you don't have really good guard play it's something that can kind of get to you and at the end of the day how many how many teams are they going to go up against where they don't have the best guards on the floor between baby t and jarkel joiner and casey Morsell? um not that often right that's got to be a top what eight backcourt in america yeah at the lowest, like they have really, really good guards. Uh, and I just think that they're built to be able to kind of find a way to make a run. Um, I like what Kevin Keats does. We've seen him have success in tournament settings when he was at UNC Wilmington. And how can you not root for the big fella, DJ Burns, as, as T.O. put it, the walking refrigerator. Um, he's got With ballet feet. feet. Yeah. yeah. How can you not root for DJ Burns? That's a that's a DTF podcast special right there. I I really like the way the NC State is built. I think that they can make a run. They, and they don't have a bad loss this year too. Yep. I, I'm looking at their at their schedule. Uh, Kansas at uh, no Kansas Pitt at home, Miami Cle at Clemson uh, at Carolina, Virginia at Virginia. Mm -hmm. So like they're beating who they're supposed to beat. My first inclination is like, well, if they play somebody, is DJ Burns going to be able to? you know, guard a mid-major that's coming off staggers and shooting. Can he get out there? But I, I just – I agree with you. I think they're really good, and they don't turn the ball over, largely in part because they don't pass it a ton, but, they, but they're but they still getting shots up at the rim. <laughs> You're not kidding. Vanta, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this last night with my would, – By the way, I would, have, I would have died laughing if you would have come on and been like, I think it's Arizona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a brain fart by me. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this last night with Miami. During the offseason, they obviously made the headlines when we had the Nigel Pack, Isaiah Wong drama of the NIL money. In that moment, you're saying, well, is Miami going to be dysfunctional? Is this going to be bad? Oh, this is life with NIL. We're going to see a bunch of other cases like this. And the fact is we didn't see a ton of those types of cases that went public and all that. Hmm. That was the best thing that could have happened for Miami. Twist. Twist. Yeah. Here's why. If you're a 17 or 18-year-old kid, you're looking at that and you're saying dollar, dollar, dollar. 
uh, I can get it at Miami. The Hurricanes can flourish in the era of NIL, and they are. And to me, they're the most dangerous team in the ACC to make that deep run because Mm -hmm. Wong and Pack together just makes for an absolute nightmare for an opposing defense. Jordan Miller is like the mop up man. He he just he seems to cover any other ground that he that they need him to do so on. And and he's a guy that just his he, he's a real tough matchup for a defense. He makes things happen. He can attack the rim. And I love the way we talked with him on After Dark earlier this year. I just loved his whole mentality. He's a great presence for that team. He played with an edge last night. Yeah, he does. He he really plays with an edge. And Omir, as Terrence said, when you've got great guard play, do you have somebody that can hold things down against an opposing big man? And that's what Omir does. He makes it hard for opposing bigs to get into a rhythm. And and he's a guy that establishes toughness. Like this is not a team that just can fill it up. They're a team that's got some grit to them. They've got a collective nature. And they've got a head coach who has not retired or walked away. Instead, he's staying around, and he's getting better with age. I mean, Jim Laranaga is one of the more underrated guys nationally for what he's done throughout the course of his career, whether it be 2006 with George Mason. But now at Miami, like if he goes to -to back-to-back Elite Eights with the Miami Hurricanes, are you kidding me? They're that good. They are good enough. And and here's the thing. You could have had that thing. He could have had that thing rolling all along if they didn't get caught up in the uh, in the FBI scandal, which was bullshit, by the way. They never they never should have been involved. They never should have had their name mentioned. Uh, they were cleared of everything. There was no violations committed. So they could have uh, they could be a dynasty right now if it if it if it had not been for um, the yeah. the uh, what is it the the southern the southern district of New York the uh, the FBI there messing up that case. But that's a different podcast for a different day. All right, last one, Pac twelve. Fanta, <laughs> we already know who you got. It's that we're going to the Pac-12 this time, Fanta. You ready? Who yeah. you got? We know who you, yeah, got. If I, who you got. If I didn't pick Alabama to win the national championship right now, I know it's the easy pick. Uh, I would pick UCLA to win it all. Um, just a team that one of the best traits you can have as a team is you can settle into a game well. They really know how to settle into a game. On Saturday night, I watched them play Oregon, and they fall behind 8 nothing. 8 nothing at Oregon. Crowd's going crazy. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know, this could be huge for Oregon, who's on the bubble, starting to play better. Oregon needs to seize this opportunity. And Jaime Jaquez does not flinch. He really doesn't. Uh, he is as winning of a player that you're going to find in college basketball. That guy just impacts winning. Mm-hmm. So they've got Hawkes, an All-American. Tiger Campbell has been with UCLA. I mean, it feels like he's in his seventh or eighth year of college. Mm-hmm. When you've got a multi-year starting point guard to hold things down, you're in a great place. Jalen Clark has gotten better. David Singleton has gotten better. Jalen Clark might be a top five defensive player in the country. Mm-hmm. 100%. One, and he's the Pac-12 steals leader. Mm-hmm. He guards like there's no tomorrow and you know when you've got all these pieces and vets it's or it just makes it easier for a big man to be able to fit in then and adam bona has been able to do that so the bruins have it they they really do they are my pick um and i think i really i really think that this team can win it all i i just I, they're the team when we talk about your ability to win six consecutive games. This is where I'll go hot take. They are the team that's most suited to win six consecutive games. In college basketball, period? In college basketball, period. Well, once upon a time, Tiger Campbell was going to DePaul. And he's turned into one of the most reliable point guards in the country. And I think I'm with Fanta. I think UCLA is geared for it. Uh, the only counter to that would be Arizona is such a matchup problem, and Azulas Tubelas is a dude, simply put. Uh, I didn't pick him first team All American. He turns around, has 40 that night 
or the next morning and it i got was, to hear it from it was, it was while you were on live literally while you were live on the show not picking him first team all-american he had 27 in the first half I know. just to say fuck you to and that's exactly what <laughs> happens that, that's becoming a reoccurring theme <laughs> <laughs> no they're they're really good and they play fast they're huge and they play fast which is uh difficult it's difficult to guard it's difficult to uh, prepare for uh, at, at some point, like Arizona is going to break through and get back uh, to that final four. I think it's possible. I just don't. I, I think um, Kylan Boswell is very good. I do think he's still a little bit away from being that reliable point guard uh, from a consistent minute standpoint, even though he has gotten better. But if I had to pick one, I, I, I'm going with UCLA for all the same reasons that Fanta did. I think they have a closer in Haquez. Uh Bona is a or Bona Bona or Bona 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 a Dem Bona like he is a he is a bona fide rim protector. Jalen Clark is one of the best wing defenders in all of college basketball. There. I see what you did there, huh? He's bona fide, bona fide. I like that. That's going to get Good used job. by Rap. Bonafide. Rap t-shirt, t-shirt. In March. Rap the only problem with making that. that t-shirt is I'm not sure he'll be around next year. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, I'm with you guys. My, my, I, I love Arizona. I think Arizona is a very, very good team. I would have them like in the top eight when it comes to winning a national title. My only concern is it's a little bit of a matchup issue, right? We've seen it with some of these other teams that play big guys that rely on big guys. If you get into a tournament setting where someone can space you out, uh, they don't have one big guy. They have two big guys that they got to play. So I'm a little worried about that. The other thing, I talked about Amari Bailey on here over and over and over again, right? His mm-hmm. last five games since he got back from injury, he's averaging 13 points. He had 24 against Oregon State. He scored double figures in four mm-hmm. of those five games. The only game he didn't score double figures in, he had eight points against Oregon. Uh, getting him going, having him playing well is everything for UCLA. It gives you a second option uh, that can kind of create. So I'm in on UCLA. I think that they yeah. are a t- they're, they're legitimately a top five team in America. Kind of want to see him beat somebody better than you know Utah, USC. Maryland, whoever, but they are very, very good. They've proven it. They have the pedigree. They've gotten to a Final Four under Mick Cronin. But listen, this has been the DTF Podcast. As always, it is fun hanging out with these two gentlemen, talking basketball, talking hoops. Make sure you subscribe, rate, review the podcast, subscribe to the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Check out our merch store, fieldof68.shop, and go check out the daily. We have a new premium product as we head into the NCAA tournament. Stats by Will is working in there. It's $10 for the rest of well, $9.99, not even $10. You save a penny yeah. there. $9.99 for the new Field of 68 daily premium product. So for Terrence Oglesby, for John Fanta, my name is Rob Doster. We will see you guys again next Monday. We're not waiting until Tuesday next week.